Welcome everyone. I am Ludmila Santa Cruz, Head of Advocacy for Save the Children Bolivia, and I will be moderating today's event. We are very happy to see so many of you in this space. Our colleagues from Save the Children, as well as colleagues from our partner organizations. The main presentations will be given in Spanish and English, and we have interpretation available live in French, English, and Spanish. So please look for the interpretation button on the bottoms of your Zoom screens. Click on the globe icon and then choose the language you prefer. We'll be recording this event and we'll share the recording together with the material upon completing the event. The climate, the climate crisis is a crisis of children's rights. But what does that mean in reality in our work, in our programs, in our advocacy, and in our campaigns? Today's webinar is the third of a series of a month-long learning session for climate and the rights of children, where we analyze the intersection between the rights of children, climate change, and environmental degradation. Throughout the month, we have highlighted the recent General Observation 26 on the rights of children and climate change, and we will continue to analyze how this new general observation can be useful for our work for the rights of children in a changing environment. This webinar is a collaboration be by the technical group on childhood, the working group on climate resilience and sustainability, and the working group on defending the climate crisis by Save the Children. It is co-sponsored by the series How to Child Rights and the Strengthening Program for Civil Society, financed by the Swedish Cooperation Agency for Development, or ASDI. The climate crisis requires that states intervene and properly address the challenges and risks around climate that children, children are facing. However, finance to face this crisis is not enough, especially for the children in developing countries. International flow of funds to address the climate change are below the estimated needs. General Observation 26 recommends that states take urgent measures to fulfill their obligation to ensure that children can exert their rights, including the right to a clean environment, a healthy environment and sustainable environment. Sources of international finance for climate, such as those from the states, must consider the defense of the rights of children and avoid them having been affected. On the recommendations and challenges, challenges posed by implementing and involving children, that, is the, will, that will be the topic of this event. For today's session, we have several panelists. I'd like to welcome Luis Pedernera, Shruti Agarwal, and Goodbye Chin Yama, who I will be introducing before their presentations. We also have the participation of two youths and that's why we will be providing some guidelines around protecting children before getting started. Second on the agenda will be a presentation by Luis Pedernera, who will tell us about the obligation of states regarding climate finance and ensuring the rights of children. After, Shruti Agarwal from Save the Children UK will be presenting the trends and implications of climate finance. And the final part, Goodbye Chenyama from Save the Children, will be showing the experience in Zambia and Malawi on advocacy for, for the public budget to finance climate as led by children. Lastly, in this webinar, we will have an opportunity to address your questions to the presenters or even share experiences from your own country in the chat. 
Before getting started, we have a few administrative messages and rules for the event. We ask that you please write your name and organization and where you're from in the chat. And we encourage you to pose your questions throughout the webinar. And for that, please use the Q&A feature that you will also find on the bottoms of your Zoom screen. Use this, use this feature instead of the chat for your questions. And please make sure to briefly introduce yourselves and then write to whom the question is, is, is being asked. When asking a question to the youth, they will, they will only answer if they feel comfortable. If not, we will review the questions after the webinar and ask for their feedback subsequently. We will ensure the respectful treatment between everyone. We will protect personal information for every participant. And in the case of feeling any discomfort or feeling that it is not a safe space, or if you feel that there are any concerns, we ask that you please report them to the focus point. And with that, we can now begin the webinar. Let's see how much we know about climate change or climate finance rather. And for that, we will invite Alar Avado to provide us with a quiz on certain subjects in the webinar. So we'll give you the floor now, Laura. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ludmila. I will uh, open a Mentimeter and Anna, my colleague, will uh, put a link for you on the chat. So this Mentimeter uh, first is to know uh, who is in who is with us today, and then we will have a quiz to check how much we know about climate finance and child rights. So, in a way, to really uh, be able also to see at the end how much we feel this uh, session has been useful. So the first question uh, for those of you take your time to join. So either you click on the link in the chat box or you do you go on mentipump.com and you use the code 32631005. 32631005, usually you need it when you're on your phone. So yes, please write which region or country you are based. Uh, and if you are a partner to Save the Children, please add your organization's name so we also see uh, the diversity of the, of, of the presence in this meeting. Thank you. I see there's more and more people joining from uh, everywhere. I haven't seen any names of partners yet, but uh, I will wait one more, a little bit more. I think I saw in the chat box earlier, there were some, some partners who presented themselves. Really happy to see so many of you, many from the United States, I can see, <laughs> which is welcome. Uh, next, I, I will... Um, I will take you to the next question. What is your main area of expertise? Is it climate change or environment? Choose one that you mostly work with. Human rights? Is it, um, do you work on, on, yeah, what do you work mostly on? Economics, finance, equality, inclusion, child participation or other? I see many of you have not yet joined this uh, this Menti, so I will repeat that you can click the link in the chat box or you can uh, go to menti.com and use a code 32631005. So I see that many work on other, if um, and many on climate specifically, some on human rights, some on economics, uh, child participation. For other, please type in the chat so that we know a bit more who is in the room. So we know what kind of area you work on uh, that would be super useful. The next question, uh, 
how would you rank your current understanding of the link between child rights and climate finance from one to five? One is low understanding, two is basic, three is medium, four is high, and five is like perfect understanding. If those, if some of you cannot join the mentee, you can also type in the chat so we have an idea um, how, you, how you feel about uh, today. You can put a number. Okay, most of you have basic understanding. Some have medium and some is low. And many of you are have high understanding as well. So I guess that today we have, a, we will see at the end, we'll ask the same question at the end and we'll see if we have, uh, if you feel that you have learned a lot of things today. Okay, so now it's time for a quiz. So there will not be a winner or a loser. <laughs> it's more for, instead of doing a presentation, which introduces a bit some terminology and some policy frameworks, we'll do that through a quiz. So you answer the question and I will provide a bit more, uh, I will provide the answers will be sometimes a bit more developed. So you get a bit of a, an introduction. Are you with me? Are you all ready? I hope so. So question one of nine. And I see there's more and more people joining. Great, great, great. I hope you can join now. What is ge a general comment? Is it a general document explaining a right? Is it an advisory opinion about a human rights situation? Is it an authoritative guide interpretation of human rights treaty obligation? or academic paper commenting issues affecting children? You can choose one answer. A general document explaining a right, advisory opinion, an authoritative interpretation of human rights treaty obligation, or academic paper commenting issues affecting children. I don't see any answers showing, but maybe it will show when I show the, the, the answers here. Let's see. No. It didn't show the answer. Yeah, no. 23 said authoritative interpretation. That was correct. Well done. And the Lewis, uh, the committee, CRC committee member, he will talk more about general comments uh, in a second, just after. The second question is general comment 26. You will choose statements, uh, choose all the correct statements. Recognizes children's right to a healthy environment, focuses on obligations under the Paris Agreement on climate change, covers a range of children's rights impacted by climate slash environment, was written by UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Climate Change, or was developed with input from 7,416 7, children from 103 countries. Which statements are correct? It recognizes children's right to a healthy environment. It covers a range of children's rights impacted by climate and environment. And it was developed with input from 7,416 children from 103 countries, correct? It was not written by the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the rights, uh, uh, human rights and climate change. It was actually adopted in May, 2023 and launched in September 2023 by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, with, uh, which is the committee of independent experts that monitors the implementation of the UN Convention and its optional protocols in each of the countries that are parties to those, to those treaties. Uh, it greens the convention. It recognizes children's right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. It covers a range of children's rights, as we said, impacted. Um, and it also was provide input from civil society was also provided as it was developed, not just from children. Uh, and in the student civil society program that some of you work with, uh, from the report 2023, we have 13 projects that reported activities relating to General Comment 26, uh, which is really uh, a great, uh, great uh, achievement that we have managed to mobilize civil society and children in this project. And Luis will tell you um, more, the, the committee member will tell you more about General Comment 26. The third question
Which of these policy documents guides states on child rights, environment, and climate financing? The UN General Comment 19 on Public Budgeting for Children's Rights, UNCRC General Comment 26 on Child Rights and the Environment with Special Focus on Climate Change, Human Rights Council Resolution 4530 on Child Rights Through a Healthy Environment. All options are correct. You should choose one answer to this. It's correct that all the options are correct. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. For example, you have the African Charter on the rights and welfare of the child that's also relevant to this, uh, as well as the, the, a number of human rights treaties, resolutions, general comments, etc. Uh, so this is just, um, just uh, a couple of ones that are relevant. Question four. Which Save the Children's Child Rights Governance Common Approach is most relevant to climate finance? So this is a specific question for Save the Children because many of you, most of you today are from Save. So which common approach that's most relevant? Public investment in children common approach? child centered social accountability common approach? Or child rights reporting common approach? Yes, it's the public investment in children common approach that's most directly linked to the climate finance, but all of these common approaches are relevant. Uh, for example, with the general comment 26, you will see that we're investing a lot in knowledge about how to use it for reporting uh, by children, by civil society, to the UN committee on how their states are implementing the convention. So the, for those of you who don't know the public investment in children common approach, it's an approach supporting analysis of national budgets it may include analysis of international cooperation budgets, including state contributions to climate finance. Question five. Which four steps are relevant for civil society to engage in national bu public budgeting cycle? Problem analysis, partnerships and capacity building, fundraising, advocacy or influencing, budgeting and expenditure analysis and monitoring. So which course that you should choose four of those? This comes from Save the Children Common Approach on Public Investment in Children. Um, and yes, indeed, it's these four, uh, you, the, you see the four, uh, the four um, elements that the steps that we have promoted in this common approach based on the experience so far. Next question. Climate finance should address climate impacts on education, health, water and sanitation, protection services, information services, all options. Yes, exactly. So all options. So proper budgeting measures are required to implement all provisions of General Comment 26, be it within specific sectors like health or education or social protection or others. But you will find explicit, explicit provisions on financing uh, linked to child rights in the context of climate environment, especially in the section on general measures of implementation. Uh, there's also a section on loss and damage and a specific section on climate finance. Uh, and you will, we will go into that uh, a bit later. So the almost finished. Climate finance is the primary responsibility of private sector, INGOs, states, community, multilateral banks, all options. So it is uh, indeed, uh, it is state's responsibility. It's not all options. 
Uh, and that is specifically uh, explained in the general comment 26. Actually, in relation to the previous question about how climate finance, what does it fund? What should it go for? There is also, you will see, there is the distribution of climate finance. It says it's overly slanted towards mitigation at the cost of adaptation and loss and damage measures, and has this, which has discriminatory effects on children who reside in settings where more adaptation measures are needed. And, and Shruti will talk more about that, and also uh, our, our colleagues uh, from, from Zambia and Malawi. And um, so states, both international climate finance providers and recipient states, should ensure that climate finance mechanisms are anchored in child risk based approach. So there's different uh, information in the general comments on this. And the almost last question, I see this is, um, which of these link to or complement climate finance? So loss and damage, SDG financing, international cooperation, national budgeting, climate justice, all options. How, which of them link to or complement climate finance? All options indeed. And in the general comment, it says also that uh, climate finance provided by developed states should be transparent, additional, uh, and we should avoid track, uh, we should be avoiding tracking challenges such as double counting. Last question for you, and then I think you will all be ready to listen to my colleagues. What do we mean by child responsive climate finance? Do we mean uh, explicit and meaningful consideration of children, investment in resilience of essential social services for children, support children's agency and participation, or all options? So, yes, it's all options. And uh, my colleague Shruti will talk more about that in, in a few minutes. Uh, so that's it uh, for this one. I will um, give the floor to, I will just show you. Um, so this is, um, This is the content of General Comment 26 that uh, uh, the committee member, the CRC committee member, Luis, will speak about. And you will see that there are specific sections that where you will have information about climate finance and financing for children's rights in this context beyond climate finance. And there's some, this you will get this presentation which, where you will see uh, also what it says about that. So all over from me now, I will give uh, the, the screen to, to June so that we can uh, give the floor to to committee member Luis too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who participated in this exercise too. I will now invite our first panelist, Luis Perarnara, who is the VP for the Committee on the Rights of Children, who has led the process of consultation for general Comment 26 in Latin America and the Caribbean. He will tell us about the obligation of states with regard to climate finance to ensure the rights of children. I'll give you the floor now, Mr. Pedernera. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Laura, for this very interesting exercise we had. Also, thanks to Save the Children for the invitation and for facilitating this exchange on General Comment 26. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. And I will be giving you a presentation specifically and maybe very um, a very basic presentation on the matter, just to encourage an exchange. The Rights of Children Committee was a body created by the uh, Children's Rights uh, uh, Organization, comprised of 26 experts with a four-year mandate 
that can be renewed, whose mandate is to address three main issues. The first, to interpret the convention. And the interpretation is done via the general comments. We are the body in charge of interpreting and integrating officially the convention. The second mandate is to examine the member states in enforcing the convention. And the third mandate, which is the newest, which has been in place since 2014 and entered into effect as of the convention, is that of receiving individual complaints on violations to the convention and also uh, to open investigations in case the committee decides that the that there is a uh, suspicion of serious violations or systematic violations to the rights of children. So with that, the general observations are part of what the committee does. To date, there have been 26 general comments or general observations that have been set out. The last was general observation 26 on the rights of children, environment, emphasizing climate. And the committee chose the broad and complex subject of climate because it's been one of the issues that children have specifically set forth on the agenda. In the general comment, the committee recognizes the historic role of children in placing this on the agenda. And to date, this general comment has convened the broadest engagement of children and adolescents and the world. As Laura said, over 17,000 children worldwide participated by sending their opinions, their documents, their comments, which have really enriched this general comment. So I'd like to reaffirm the role of the committee in elaborating general comments because although there are a few, there are still certain states that question the mandate of the committee and committees when creating general comments. Elaborating the general observations or general comments came from Article 45 of the Convention, 44 and 45, which states that the committee can elaborate suggestions and recommendations to convey to the party states and present them to the General Assembly. And then in the internal regulations for the committee under Article 77, it dives somewhat deeper in the sense that In, in the sense of these general observations. Can I move the uh, slides? Okay, thank you. A general comment takes two years to see the light of day. The last decision by the committee was to align the general comments elaboration process with a prior activity that the committee undertakes, which is the general debate day. The general debate days are moments that take place every two years in September, where the committee invites the stakeholders and the states and the children and organizations, uh, that is NGOs and uh, academia, to send in their contributions on a certain matter that the committee seeks to learn more about or that seeks to place on the agenda. In 2016, the committee had a general debate day on the rights of children and environment, but almost 10 years later, eight years later, the committee adopted a general comment on the environmental matter. The committee then decided that that time should be uh, 
shorter and the debate should come closer to the time of uh, issuing the general comments. And now we are elaborating the next general comment. So I encourage the Save the Children offices and everyone else who engages as partners of Save the Children to get involved and to send us your contributions on access to justice and measures to be taken for children and adolescents. The goal of general of the general comment is basically to clarify the obligations that states have with regard to the convention. This is what the general comment states and is repeated throughout the general comments. That is, it is orientation on the measures that states must take to implement the convention measures at the administrative level legislative levels judicial and particularly in the general comments the committee also talks about what measures should st states take to address environmental damage with special attention to climate change but in turn in this uh, general comment the committee also emphasizes the serious effects against the environment and climate change when exerting children's rights throughout the world. And it's also about a holistic interpretation of the rights of children and in protecting the environment. And I mentioned this because in the general comment, the committee takes two articles, which are the only two articles in the convention that address the environment. One is on the right to health and the other article is on the right to education. And the committee with those two articles then interprets holistically the rights of children to grow in a healthy environment. Since that is not the subject of today's presentation, I will simply encourage you to read on the matter because in the general comment, the committee establishes that based on a reading, a holistic reading of the convention, children have the right to grow in a healthy and, and a proper environment. On next slide, next slide, please. Maybe I can share my screen instead. As we saw from Laura in the initial questions, the general comment addresses many matters, but specifically when looking at climate finance, under the general comment, we see with greater clarity as of section four and section five, uh, section four is where the committee talks about the general implementation measures. And there in section four and five, the committee then focuses several paragraphs on the matter of climate finance. There are certain matters that orient the way in which the committee drafts and, and those of you who are here who work on environmental matters, you know this better than I, but it's about acknowledging the common and differential responsibilities when it comes to climate finance. At the start of section four, the committee reaffirms the obligation that states have to respect, protect, and enforce the rights of children. And for that, in this slide, we have a few of the, of the points that show that the states must abstain from causing environmental harm 
They must protect them from the damages originating from other sources, third-party sources, and even commercial enterprises. They must prevent and remedy the environmental hazards around the rights of children. They must adopt urgent measures to fulfill their obligation to facilitate, promote, and ensure the rights of children. And they must focus the maximum number of resources. This is, for, this is from Article 4 of the Convention. Uh, human, uh, financial, natural, technology, institutional, and data-related resources to enforce the rights of children whenever necessary under the international cooperation framework. This is to understand fin uh, climate finance. That is, the way in which the committee addresses the matter of finance is based on the premise of common responsibilities, but differential responsibilities. It's the situation in certain countries that for years or decades have seen how natural resources have been spoiled or comparing countries with regard to greenhouse gas emissions to then say that here the responsibilities are common, but the levels are different. It's different to say that the global South countries have a certain responsibility and the nor global North have others. The second issue for the committee, next slide, The second matter that the committee emphasizes says that this must take place under international cooperation. The, the general observation says that obligations must be oriented towards mitigating and adapting based on historical and current emissions of greenhouse gases. And for that, the states must then develop, as it, as it says in a general comment, they must facilitate technical and financial assistance to developing states as per Article 4 of the Convention. Next. Here, one of the questions that I was asked for this presentation was, what can we do? Or rather, what does the committee do with this general observation? The general observation is the interpretation done by the body. And the committee encourages the states to use it to develop their own policies. But the committee also, when it comes to climate change, well, since climate change is a transnational phenomenon, it not only addresses uh, climate, but climate as it pertains to the states. And there, there can be two issues stemming from this. One, they can use the convention to formulate the recommendations to the party states. And here I selected two examples. There is a third example, also a more recent example, but these are examples of countries that we've examined after having adopted the General Observation 26. Dominican Republic, in our recommendations to Dominican Republic, we stress the need to assess the effects of pollution in the air water and soil, and based on that, establish a strategy to remedy the situation and regulate the maximum uh, contaminants allowed in the water and in the air. We have also told them that they have to finance and enforce national policies for sustainability and to provide water, particularly to 
the areas that are most affected. And for that, we've established that a thermoelectric plant uh, called Punta Catalina must be used or must be addressed that it has that has had a lot of effects on the environment. For example, it has changed the sea currents and it has also It has also displaced the fauna in the region and fishermen can no longer fish there because the fish are not there. And it is also contaminated underwater, underground water and the land and therefore crops can also not uh, grow or be grown in the area. We have asked them to look at that thermoelectric plant and we've, we have asked that they take measures when it comes to environmental damage and particularly the cross-border effects. The information we have states that the contaminating particles towards Haiti are causing effects on the population and on children in their lungs, respiratory issues, and are creating illnesses. And that is why the committee is recommending that these, that, that, that's why the committee has made these recommendations to Dominican Republic. And it's one of the first countries that the committee uses as an instrument to formulate recommendations. But we've also looked at Finland. In Finland, we have told Finland that they must adopt legislative and other measures to fulfill their extraterritorial uh, obligations with regard to environmental uh, impact. Most of the industries in Finland take place in other territories and the committee has posed the matter of extraterritorial issues to them where they must assess and measure their commercial operations and their international cooperation. when these operations take place beyond their territory. And more recently, we looked at Paraguay. In Paraguay, or to Paraguay, we have also proposed specific uh, steps. Particularly, we've told Paraguay that they must demand that companies respond to these issues in their operations and throughout their supply chain, and that they publicly publish the impact of their activities on the environment, health, and the rights of children, as well as their plans to remedy that impact. The other matter that the committee can address is around receiving complaints individually. The committee has some history, some background doing this. In 2019, Greta Thunberg, together with 16 uh, youths from many places in the world, filed a lawsuit against Germany, Argentina, Brazil, Turkey, and France be, uh, for their greenhouse gas emissions. This committee declared that the lawsuit was inadmissible because it did not meet the requirements internally but the committee did develop certain uh, case law that is now considered by certain sectors of the academia as an advanced case law with regard to the responsibilities, extraterritorial responsibilities, extraterritorial responsibilities of states when children are not necessarily from that country or state. And, it, and they have said that states can be uh, sued even if children do not live in that country and even if the children are not from that country. The committee has stated that it can receive a lawsuit from a children in the, from children in the Marshall Islands against France, for example. And this has been significant progress when it comes to case law. That's why the committee, in the case of Finland, is telling Finland that they must define their extraterritorial obligations 
based on the activity that they carry out beyond the state's territory. The other issue that the committee pays special attention to when it comes to climate finance, and I'll conclude with this, is that in one of the sections from the general observation, the committee specifically points out banking. Under the name climate finance, the committee draws attention to international banking on the matter of the role that they have in contamination and in projects that contribute to environmental degradation. Throughout the creation process for the general observation, the committee stated that many projects that are financed by international banking in the case of Latin America, the Inter-American Development Bank, or the Inter International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. These are all projects that are not sustainable and that contribute to the environmental degradation and to environmental impacts. So in that sense, international banking also has a responsibility in ensuring that any project or every project must be sustainable and must not affect the environment or affect the rights of children. As we said at the beginning, the general observation takes two years to create. And in that process, we have consulted with several sources. We did regional consultations here in Latin America we did one in Buenos Aires with over 300 participants. And the inputs that we received are then translated into the general observation. Here, you might see some of your contributions, in fact. The last question that I was asked was, how is the general observation uh, addressed? And here I must give you the sad news that for now, uh, it is not connected to the COP. In preparing my presentation, I consulted with my South African colleague, who is the current co committee chair. I asked her if she participated in the COP with my Swiss colleague, and I asked them, did the committee receive any special invitation to participate in the COP? And the committee did not, in fact, receive any invitation to participate in the COP. They participated because UNICEF and certain related uh, organizations facilitated support so that they could, so that the chairperson could go together with my Swiss colleague. But the COP does not consider General Observation 26. COP does not or has not invited the committee to engage from its uh, very beginnings. And the committee's participation has been uh, by invitation, but not recognized as a body that monitors enforcement of the convention. So, in that regard, I think it's important that you know this. You do have some advocacy in the COP. You do participate directly or through your partners, but it's good that you know that sometimes Sometimes the United Nations agenda takes a different path. But policy should indeed have children at the core of their endeavors. We have an agenda on different paths, paths with the, uh, on different paths as far as the UN. And, and you should know this. So I just wanted to conclude with this call to action or this, uh, or this point to emphasize, we ask that the states take our general uh, comments, but COP is one of the main events on the environment and climate change that so far does not have any point of contact with the committee to take what the committee tells states or, or what the committee interprets through their general observations with regard to the rights of children and the environment. And I mention this because the committee is emphasizing 
increasingly emphasizing that this space is a space where children must feel represented and where the voice of children must be amplified. That's why we had a historic level of engagement by children in this general observation. And that's why the committee also acknowledges their historical contribution. They are the ones who brought up climate change on the agenda, in fact, and children came to the committee for the first time to file a lawsuit, and therefore we cannot let our agenda to continue on a totally different or separated path. If we want change, the first thing we must do is have our agendas match. And at the United Nations, that is unsustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis Pedernero, for your presentation on the challenges of states in climate finance and in ensuring rights. To all participants, we encourage you to send in your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature. And please do not forget to include your names and to write to whom the question is being asked. To continue with the agenda, we will now continue with Shruti Agarwal, the main advisor on climate change and sustainable economy at Save the Children, at the UK office. Shruti will speak to us about the trends in climate finance and will share some best examples, some best practices. Go ahead, Shruti. Thank you, Ludmila, and thank you, uh, Louis. I think that presentation, your presentation, ended with a very useful reminder on the need for better integration between the general comment and the COP processes and something for us to remind ourselves of time and again. Um, I am Shruti, I'm with a Senior Climate Advisor with Save, Ch Save the Children UK, and I support our global advocacy on climate finance. I will be speaking to you mainly on uh, the trends in international climate finance flows, and uh, then talk you through some recommendations, uh, some of our recommendations on how we think international climate finance flow can deliver better for children. And uh, when we talk about international climate finance, we are here referring to um, climate finance flows from high income countries to lower income countries to support them with the climate uh, goals. Thanks. Next slide, please. So before we start, just so that all of us are on the same page on what climate finance means and how it's defined, uh, there, as many of you know, there are different pillars to climate action. There's mitigation, which is about reducing carbon emissions or, or enhancing carbon sinks. Uh, there's adaptation, which is about reducing vulnerability or uh, and increasing resilience. Uh, and these are generally the two pillars within which climate finance has been historically defined as including by the Standing Committee on Finance, which is a body under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But something's missing in this definition. Can you take a guess on what's missing in this definition and put that, put your response in the chat very quickly? And next slide, please. What's missing from the definition? Yes, great. Correct. Some really correct answers popping up. Uh, it is indeed, uh, next slide, next please. It is indeed loss and damage, which has been historically not included in uh, the climate finance definition. And there is a long uh, and ongoing advocacy and campaign going on to make sure that loss and damage is recognized as the third pillar of climate finance formally. And this is something we at Save the Children are also aligning behind and pushing for. Next, please. So now that we have the definition, there's a question on who should be providing climate finance. And Louise and Laura have also touched on this in the uh, in the in their slides and their sessions. So I just want to quickly take you through the different agreements that exist, which call on the obligations of developed countries. Uh, there is a Paris Agreement, which says that developed countries should be taking the lead. Next, there is a 
the UNFCCC convention itself, which has been ratified by all the parties, which talks about the commit, uh, the obligation of develop, developed countries uh, to provide new and additional funding. And I'll be using developed countries and high income countries interchangeably during the session. And then there was uh, the COP that happened in 2009 in Copenhagen, where the Copenhagen Accord uh, made a decision that uh, developed countries will be mobilizing uh, $100 billion uh, for developing countries uh, by 2020. And then uh, this, these obligations of developed countries are further reinforced by the general comment. Next, please. Uh, spe specifically, if you look at paragraphs 112 and 113, and these obligations, the general comment links these obligations to uh, the importance of upholding uh, child children's rights as well. Next, please. So there are these obligations that developed countries have, but how are they faring on them? Are they doing well? No, mm -hmm. not so much. So the 100 billion pledge, which was supposed to be met by 2020 was not actually met by that year. There is the report that came out this year, which said that the goal has finally been met in 2022. But these figures that are reported uh, by the um, OECD are hugely contested by developing countries and by civil society organizations. Oxfam, in fact, there is an estimate by Oxfam which says that what is being reported versus what is being delivered, the difference could be as big as 66%. So there is massive discrepancy uh, in what is being counted as climate finance and what should be counted as climate finance. There are also concerns that these, this, most of this climate finance has not been delivered as new and additional funding. And Laura also touched on the issue of double counting order, which is happening in the name of climate, in the name of climate finance. Bulk of this climate finance has also been delivered in the form of loans and not grants. And with uh, uh, a significant share of these loans being offered at market rates. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, international climate finance being heavily skewed in favor of mitigation, that is reducing emissions, uh, and adaptation finance has been historically marginalized, and the gap for adaptation finance has been growing year after year. Now there are discussions that have initiated uh, that have started uh, in 2022 and are expected to conclude this year at COP29, where this hundred billion goal will be replaced by a new uh, number. Uh, and we are hoping uh, that this new goal will take into account all of these different lessons that have been uh, learned as part of the 100 billion process. Next, please. So that's more generally on what uh, is happening with uh, climate finance, the international climate finance flows. But what about climate finance for children and their rights? So we last year worked with the children's environmental Rights Initiative Coalition, which is a group of child rights agencies working on children's environmental rights. And uh, we did an analysis which looked at 591 fraud projects that had been funded over a period of 17 years um, by four multilateral funds, which includes the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, and two funds under the uh, Global Environment Facility. And uh, we, we looked for uh, the objective of the analysis was to understand the extent to which these projects could be considered child responsive. And when we say child responsive, as Laura had hinted, uh, had in one of our questions, we were actually looking at three specific uh, criteria. We wanted to see whether children had been meaningfully considered, whether uh, children's essential services were being financed, and whether the projects were supporting children's agency and participation. And when there were and projects that met all three criteria were considered uh, to be child responsive. What we found was that just 2.4% of climate finance from all of these funds were actually uh, in, had incorporated child responsive interventions. And this too is an overestimate. Next, please. Uh, education is one of the sectors that has been historically sidelined in climate finance of the 591 projects. There was just one project which is education as its primary objective. Next, please. Uh, similarly, for food security and nutrition and uh, a health and social sector, we found that the, uh, the share of projects with child responsive interventions continued to stay uh, under 6% or 1%. Next, please. 
next next and then in uh, the case of gender we we hear a lot about a uh, gender being mainstreamed in climate finance uh, decision making processes in climate uh, fund in projects in climate projects but what we found was that there were less than 4% of the projects that were actually talking about or meaningfully considering girls um, in the project activities, objectives, and outcomes. So while gender is being mainstreamed, there's still a long way in considering the, the unique uh, risks that girls experience uh, as a result of the climate crisis within, within climate programming. Next, please. So now we, we've got a sense of what broadly these challenges are, and it's sort of difficult within the scope of this presentation to touch upon everything. But in terms of the broader challenges, there are some recommendations we have uh, for governments uh, that, uh, that they can implement in order to address some of these challenges. We are um, we, we think they can uh, provide new and additional funding. They can close that. Uh, they should be closing the adaptation finance gap. They should be providing funding for losses and damages. They should be delivering climate finance primarily in the form of grants, uh, especially for adaptation and loss and damage. The new climate finance goal, also called the new collective quantified goal on climate finance, is being uh, discussed and negotiated this year. There will be an agreement on it at COP29 in Baku. We are calling on governments to support an, a very ambitious uh, goal, which is going far beyond the 100 billion and which is designed to deliver child and gender responsive outcomes. We are also, like I said earlier, pushing for loss and damage to be recognized as the third critical pillar on climate finance. We uh, governments can scale significantly uh, scale up investments in to build the climate resilience of child critical social services, education, health, nutrition, wash, etc. And then, last but not least, integrate the meaningful engagement and participation of children in all climate uh, finance related processes. So these are some of the steps that governments can and should be taking. Uh, but in addition to that, there is uh, there are things that climate finance providers, include, including developed countries, can be doing to make their climate finance more responsive to the needs of the children as well. Uh, next, please. And these are some of the ways we identified um, in collaboration with other child rights agencies that uh, uh, can measures that can be adopted in order to make climate finance more uh, responsive. Uh, to the needs of unique needs of children. So if uh, climate finance providers should be reviewing and updating their uh, institutional policies and strategies and plans. And when they're designing these policies, uh, we want them to be explicitly considering child responsive objectives and uh, uh, include and engage children, child rights, gender experts in the design of these policies. We have a uh, lot of climate finance providers are using gender markers to track the contribution of their projects to gender responsive outcomes. So we're saying, why don't we have a similar marker for children? Uh, we are also saying that, you know, there are these uh, gender assessments that are required ahead of uh, uh, project development or uh, during, during project development for climate funding. Why don't we have similar uh, child rights impact uh, assessment processes for, uh, for children as well? When, when a project uh, for climate uh, action is being developed. So these are some of the measures uh, we have identified and we are uh, pushing climate finance providers to integrate. And uh, then uh, my last next piece. And then if you are all wondering whether, yeah, that's, that all sounds good in principle, but is that, are there examples of those, uh, are there any examples of these uh, child responsive projects out there? Turns out there are, uh, there are not that many, but there are some to uh, to give us a sense of the direction of travel we should be adopting. Uh, there are two projects that um, I have uh, uh, identified here, and they're also available in our uh, report, uh, which came out last year. It's called Falling Short Report, and I would request um, a, the link, a link to the report we posted in the chat box so that you all have access to it. There are more examples in that report, but these two specific projects uh, sort of just give you a sense of how they managed to uh, fulfill the three criteria that we had identified in, uh, in understanding um, child responsiveness of uh, climate funding. And you can see that we've given examples on how they did this. Uh, so that's generally to get, give you a sense of how 
child responsive climate projects have been designed and these are good examples to build on as future funding for climate uh, is being considered. With that, I will stop. Um, thank you very much for listening and over to you, Ludmila. Thank you, Shruti, for your presentation on these very important uh, points you talked about and recommendations you mentioned about climate finance, responsible climate finance. Continuing with our webinar, we now invite uh, good, goodbye Chin Yama, who is a technical specialist on public finance for Zambia and Malawi, and is the lead technical person on poverty, childhood, and climate change in Zambia for Save the Children to talk about experiences in these two countries on public investment in childhood, budgeting, that is friendly to children, and advocacy processes in budgeting led by children. You have the floor. You have the floor, goodbye. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually out of the office, so uh, there is challenge in terms of network, so I'll switch off my my video. Um, next slide. Next slide. Yes. Um, generally, we focus much uh, in terms of the budget because it is a political tool that is used by various governments to finance their interests and priorities. So once a priority is, is missed uh, in terms of budget allocation, that means that for the whole year, nothing much is going to happen in that specific uh, sector. So uh, it is actually an instrument whereby the government clearly specify in terms of uh, how it is going to spend uh, the revenue that it will collect. And through that revenue, usually there is uh, a deficit or surplus, which they usually cover for the deficit using uh, debt or public debt, either domestic or international. Well, so uh, we are interested in budgeting uh, as for ch Save the Children uh, in Zambia and Malawi uh, because uh, budgets and policies are not neutral instruments. Like I said, these are political tools. So the government usually finance where it is interested in. So general children, because they don't vote, for these uh, governments, the, the government usually don't take it serious to recognize the interests of children. So they even go further to ensure that maybe they can finance a youth or women uh, uh, related sectors uh, because come next elections, they'll be voted out if they don't do that. So how best to ensure that now all these uh, budget processes are child sensitive. So there is need now need to ensure that we hold the government uh, accountable to ensure that they promote equality and also to ensure that uh, the gender gaps are also addressed and also the marginalized and poor are also taken into consideration. Next slide. So generally in terms of the budget process as uh, Save the Children in Zambia and Milau, we have to make sure that children participate in all the budget processes or the budget cycle. Uh, Usually the budget, there is formulation in terms of the stages, there is formulation, there is adoption, there is implementation, and sometimes evaluation. So those are just the steps that are usually involved in budget processing. But for the case of Zambia and other governments, we realize that the Minister of Finance usually come up with, uh, with uh, 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 a statement which uh, they publish. Uh, like for the case of Zambia, the budget post process timeline is outlined in the National Planning and Budgeting Act, number one of 2022. So this is the example I just want to show you where we need to make sure that children participate on all those processes. So I've just picked some key uh, stages where we want to make sure that children participate and we make it uh, possible for children participating in all those uh, uh, processes. So what we have done is that uh, uh, 
children must participate in the enactment or formulation of the budget policy paper. A budget policy paper is a document that sets out the broad uh, strategic priorities uh, and policy goals that will guide the national government in preparing uh, the budget uh, for the following financial year and also maybe for the media uh, term. So usually the government then invite the state and state actors uh, submission of budget proposals. So that's where now we engage children, where they contribute in terms of what exactly they want the government to address on that particular year. So we bring them together in their groups. They make proposals. We ch children actually, with the help of us, they consolidate and come up with their uh, proposals, which would then be presented to the Ministry of, of Finance. And then there is also policy hearing or consultations of bu budget policy paper. And then there is also a uh, public consultation on green paper, uh, which is usually uh, done uh, towards uh, end of uh, or, or, or end of July each year. So green papers are documents that are a particular public policy issue released by the government in order to stimulate discussion and feedback from key uh, uh, stakeholders. So we need to make sure that uh, children are also consulted and contribute to that and ensure that whatever they are doing as government, uh, everything is child uh, sensitive. And then after they have done that, there is need now to ensure that there is budget hearing. Budget hearings whereby the Ministry of Finance, together with some parliamentary committees, they make rounds in the country, especially in provinces, inviting relevant stakeholders so that they contribute or to hear their views in terms of the proposal that they have submitted. And then they'll now come up with a clear view in terms of what are the people really uh, expecting the government to address. And then after that, the Minister of Finance will present uh, the budget uh, in National Assembly or Parliament. And then there will be no budget debates to analyze that budget. So that's where now we also bring children to ensure that when they participated during the consultations, things that they have pre presented, were they taken into consideration by the government uh, or included in the budget? And then when they are analyzing, they want to make sure that those things were included. So if not, that's when they, they make some follow-ups with the various parliamentary committees so that they don't vote or approve uh, the, the budget. Next slide, please. Yes, so our engagement uh, with children uh, for both Zambia and Malawi uh, in terms of their challenges uh, of participating in climate financing, uh, they actually hinted that there is a gap in terms of the skills and knowledge in terms of how best they can analyze the budget. Uh, as it stands, very few children and youth were capacitated uh, in terms of budget analysis. So there is a strong gap uh, on that. And then also in terms of uh, uh, con communicating uh, climate risks, uh, we realized that uh, most climate change information is not yet in child-friendly uh, language, making it difficult for children to understand. There is a lot of jargon, so how best we can make it child-friendly to ensure that we reduce the content at a level whereby children can easily understand. And also, there are no defined channels of communication to reach to children on climate change. All those things were actually coming out uh, from children and also lack of IC materials on, uh, on, on climate change, which are child sensitive. Because if you check some of the materials, they are materials that are designed by experts and trying to convey a message, which sometimes is not easy for children to interpret. And then when we're talking in terms of uh, connecting with uh, children or their peers, uh, as well as with decision makers on climate change, we, children actually indicated that they've got limited opportunities to learn from each other within and between countries, as an example. There is actually uh, a gap in terms of how best they can learn from others so that they come back and able to implement in their respective countries. And then in terms of institutional coordination and support for encouraging children and youth uh, action, we re realized that uh, uh, there is absence of uh, local legislations, guidelines, and as well as enforcement to support child-led climate change, uh, local initiatives, especially local-led adaptation. And then also there is lack of coordination between various players, uh, even with schools at local level, how best schools can work with local structures, like for example, what development committees uh, at local level, so that whatever they are doing, they also include in decision-making process, the children to make sure that their voices 
are ahead. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, specific interventions that we've been carrying out uh, in relation to budgeting um, uh, in Zambia and Malawi, we build the capacity of children and youth on child-friendly budget analysis and advocacy. Also, we build the capacity of children on the use of social accountability tools, such as budget hearing, public expenditure tracking, so that at least they've got that knowledge and information. So these tools are actually child-sensitive, because we use uh, locally, uh, simplified versions of uh, of uh, training materials whereby children can easily interpret and able to apply. We also build the capacity of children in child participation so that they understand their role, that it is not uh, uh, maybe a choice to say I have to participate, but it's their right uh, to participate and demand those services from the government. And working with children, we developed uh, the Generation Hope campaign strategy for both Zambia and Malawi, uh, which actually articulates uh, the role of climate finance to address some of the children that some of the challenges that children are facing in these respective countries. And then we also formed uh, and strengthened child and youth budget groups. These are in schools and in communities whereby the capacity uh, uh, are, are strengthened in terms of how best they can work together to make decisions, how best they can mobilize other children and uh, cascade the information and how best other children can participate in decision-making processes. And then after that, we had child participation budgeting processes. Uh, like for example, we had child parliament and we, have, uh, we had various and serious uh, engagement with parliamentary clusters or committees in both countries. And then also we've been working around child sensitive debt restructuring. You realize some of the countries, like for example, Zambia and Malawi, realize that the budget part of it, like for Zambia, you know, at one of the time it realized that it was about 70% of the budget was going towards debt service. So in the event that you want the government to allocate more resources towards education, towards climate change, for example, they will tell you that we are servicing debt, we don't have enough. So how best we can make sure that when they are discussing around debt restructuring, it is child sensitive to ensure that the ring fence, whatever the gains they will get from debt restructuring towards financing uh, climate change or social sector spending. And then also uh, we have been discussing or working with children around child sensitive domestic resource mobilization. You realize that most of these budgets, if you check, uh, especially for Zambia and Malawi, you realize that uh, uh, most of the revenue is actually coming from uh, donors, ODA and so forth, and less from domestic resources. And at the same time, the government is losing much through illicit financial flows, tax havens, uh, tax uh, incentives, and so forth, at the expense of uh, ensuring that uh, it is progressive for the local people. So how best children can participate in domestic resource mobilization. So once they participate and all the gov government accountable in terms of raising, raising revenue, it will be easy for them to demand uh, services from the government. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we have got uh, um, some projects, not the, the previous one. We have got some projects that are supporting uh, the work that we are doing around uh, uh, climate finance or public investment children for both Zambia and Malawi. We used to have uh, CEDA driving sustainable change for children's lives that came to an end last year. Uh, on this one, I think we build the capacity of children uh, around forming groups, around budgeting processes and so forth. And also we've got CEDA CSO uh, that is actually building the capacity of the local partners uh, to be able to uh, involve children in budgeting, budgeting processes. We also used part of it from the impact funds like NORAD frame in Malawi. We've got Irish aid that is what was one objective on uh, climate financing, also child sponsorship for both countries. We have got my MP project uh, of Pungwanga in Malawi, supported by AU. And this project is actually focusing much in terms of uh, debt uh, sustainability, how best the parliament can initiate and ensure that they've got a debt sustainability plan. Next slide. Sorry, goodbye. Thank you very much for your presentation, but we have to give the floor now to the children who have been invited.
yeah next uh, i wanted to say uh for for uh malawi we had some challenges in terms of uh, organizing logistics for faith to be able to participate on this platform so i'll just take through uh a presentation uh in a few minutes next slide so basically uh we brought eight children together from seven districts uh, whereby we wanted them to be able to analyze the budget and come up with a position paper. So uh, we build their capacity in terms of how best they can analyze the budget, understanding all the processes. Next slide. Yes, so in terms of child-friendly budgeting, so our first step was that uh, they reflected on the challenges that they are facing around climate change, and then they prioritized those problems and rank them to say, these are the key issues that we want the government to address. And then eventually they had to go to the budget itself, which was presented by the Minister of Finance and analyze that budget. So they've done it through three processes. The first one is that they identified three things from the budget that make them happy. So we wanted to make it a simplified kind of engagement for children. We just said, identify just three things that make you help as children. And then what are the challenges that you think this budget is not addressing? And then what are the recommendations you can give to the mini, to the members of parliament as well as, as, well as to the government to ensure that, that they make take that into consideration? Next slide. Yes, in terms of identification of at least, uh, at least three things, those are things that you've identified because we have to break them into groups. One group was talking about climate change as an example. The other group was talking about uh, education. The other group was talking about disability as, a, as an example. So the group that was talking about climate change, that's where you can see that there are children who are climate change advocates, uh, climate change champions, who are specifically dealing with cl climate change in Malawi. Even some of them, they are child members of parliament uh, for Malawi, specifically focusing on climate change. So those are some of the three things that they observed that the government uh, managed to address. For example, the government allocated about 13.5 million uh, billion kwacha to disaster risk management, as an example. Next slide. And then also in terms of the challenge they continue to face, they realized that uh, the budget and environment climate change, it has actually decreased by 39%, which was a huge impact in terms of addressing some of the challenges that they are facing. And also child sensitive community structures are not in place to ensure sustainable management of the planted trees. And then also the after disasters, like, you know, there was cyclone in Malawi, which destroyed a lot of buildings, trees, uh, rivers were polluted and so forth. They were not cleaned eventually. So they had to see that the budget is not actually addressing some of the challenges. Next slide. And then uh, in terms of implications, say if now all these things are not going to be addressed, what will be the, the result? They said there's, there will be a lot of deforestation. There will be a lot of water pollution and air pollution. There will be climate crisis like food and cyclones. Also, there's exposure of girls to different forms of vulnerability like sexual harassment due to loss of their parents during disasters. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. So they came up with their recommendation. We just said, come up with key, clear challenges that you think the government has to address. So under the Domestic Resource Mobilization uh, Trust Fund, the government should at least, I mean, Disaster Risk Management Trust Fund, the government should at least include 10 to 20 percent of its fund to psychosocial support therapy so that children who have been emotionally affected regain to normal mental well-being. And also the government should allocate more funds in the meteorological services for increased access to early, of early warning uh, meteorological information. And also they proposed that the construction and maintenance, maintenance of infrastructure, which was destroyed uh, or, or, or are not strong enough to withstand uh, the disaster. And also the government should also introduce guidelines on carbon tax for all cars that produce toxic fumes, as an example. Next slide. Yeah, see, uh, after they've uh, presented the budget, uh, if they, if they came up with their position paper and then engaged or had some interface meetings with the parliamentary uh, cluster committees. And you can see that one is one of the stories that was there in the newspaper where they engaged even the, the media, 
uh, both print and 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 uh, and uh, uh, national broadcasting, like uh, Malawi Broadcasting Corporation, uh, and also they are actually in the process of engaging the non in the non state actors to ensure that their issues are also taken uh, uh, into consideration, and they are in the process of uh, tracking expenditure after the budget has been presented. They want to see if the budget is going to be uh, disbursed based per plan and see that the funds are actually reaching the uh, end result or the end user who are actually the children at local level. Next slide. Yes, so the next presentation will be coming from Longway. So Longway, may you take uh, charge? Thank you. Long way, may you please pr present? Where could you please present? He's saying he can be allowed to speak. It seems he's on mute. He can't unmute. I'm not sure. He's he sent a text on uh, on on chat to say, "On where can he be allowed to speak?" Uncle Camila, could you please authorize Long Way? Could you please turn on his microphone? Hello everyone, my name is Longwe Mtonga. I'm 18 year old from Zambia and I am a climate change advocate with Save the Children Zambia. Can uh, can you can you get me? Yes. Yes, we can hear can you. you. Yes. All right, thank you. I think we can uh, uh next from the side. So I I'm part of what we call the Children's News Agency, which is um, an agency for children that is supported by Save the Children Zambia. And some of the activities that we do is we first gain capacity to be junior reporters and also to be we are trained to become advocates for children's rights and climate change. So some of the work that we do in activities is sensitize communities on children's rights and climate change. We publish magazines and articles on climate change stories from local communities, especially from a child's perspective. We engage with multiple stakeholders in our advocacy campaign, and we also champion child-led advocacy in child rights and climate change since the children's news agency is run only by children. Next. So some of the activities we do is we have national develop, development plan consultations. So in Zambia, we are currently on the eighth national development plan. And before this plan was actually put into action, we were engaged with the stakeholders and policymakers to also look at this, to also review it as children. So with the help, with save, with the help from Save the Children, we've got a child-friendly version of the eighth national development plan. And we had an opportunity to contribute where we saw that most of the um, plan, most of the things that were in the national development plan were not child sensitive. And so we advocated and we also put in submissions of what we thought was missing and we, what we wanted government to add. Then the other one is on national budget submissions. So recently, uh, right now we are currently in the 2024 national budget, but before this, we actually, got a, a, an opportunity to participate in the national budget submissions. And we also had a simplified child friendly budget analysis, which was given to us. And uh, yeah, that was last year so that it could give, give us a well-informed perspective from where we can start from to put in our submissions and also um, just add what we wanted to see as children because most of our national budget was used only for a uh, date uh, to facilitate date, and then the rest was divided into different sectors. But you find that there was less allocation 
that was actually child sensitive. And so we had an opportunity as children to also give our own budget submissions. Then we also could develop policies in, with line ministries that directly affect children. Currently, we have the Children's Court Act in Zambia, which is the law that prohibits child marriage and other harmful practices against children. So with in connection with the Ministry of Community Development, we've been able to draft what we call the Child Participation Framework, which is a framework or a policy that is used nationwide to make sure that the measures put in place, that children should participate at different communities, I mean, at different levels of community, whether it's at local level, whether it's at um, provincial level, or whether it's at national level. And while this was being created, we we're also part of the process and we also co-developed the policy with the ministry, adding what we wanted it to be like, what we wanted to see. And we now have what we call the child participation framework, in, including other policies that we also co-developed with uh, the direct ministries and departments that are alleged to it. Then we also participate in public investment and engagement with line ministries, especially in the case of child sensitive climate change. Next. So we, ha we have what we call the Action Hope campaign, which is a global campaign for and with children and young people calling for urgent action on climate change. Next. So last year, I had an opportunity. I wrote a letter to the Minister of Green Economy and Environment expressing the challenges, the multiple challenges that we as children face and also what we propose to see. And we were also, one of the challenges that I actually um, wrote in the letter, and as you can see, the, the letter, which is there, the picture, that's the actual letter that I wrote. And one of the challenges is that we never had actual defined um, platforms for participation and engagement, especially in issues of climate change. Children were also side, were always sidelined and you find that only multiple stakeholders and adults would attend such meetings, even if it comes to addressing what uh, children are facing re with regards to climate change. And so those are some of the challenges that we expressed in the letter and then submitted it to the minister on World Environment Day. And from there, the minister read through the letter and he invited me and my friend who wrote another letter to his office where we went and to just have an to have a discussion to just dive deep into the challenges that we children are facing especially in our communities in our schools the participation platforms that we knew we were lacking and also the solutions we didn't just go there with problems but we also went with the solutions that we wanted as children that we thought can also be put in place to help at least raise adaptation measures in communities in schools for children to not be highly affected by the effects of climate change and one of the solutions that we also came up with is we wanted children to participate under the Zambian delegation at the COP28. And we submitted it to the minister and we agreed. And for the first time last year, we had children who actually attended the COP under the delegation from Zambia. Next. So this is the picture of the engagement that we had with uh, the Minister of Green Economy. And that was me and my friend who were, this was just after we went to school and uh, the day after we submitted the letter. So we had an engagement with him. We had a discussion on different issues. And it was from there also that the minister concluded that we needed that there will, there will be establishment of more child participation platforms that we really have um, here in Zambia, especially when it comes to discussions or discourses of climate change. Next. Oh yeah, so I think that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for the opportunity. If there are any questions, um, can be turned to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Longway, for your very interesting presentation and for sharing your experience in advocacy in your country. Thank you so much. We are in the final stretch of our webinar. And here I'd like to remind you that in the Q&A feature, we have answered almost all the questions that have come in. I'd like to also remind you that 
we've placed the links to the documents that have been discussed in this presentation for you to download. I would really like to thank all of our panelists for having shared your knowledge and experience. And as a conclusion, I'd like to highlight from the first presentation from Luis Peroneta that we talked about uh, the General Observation 26 and how it addresses the responsibility of states in climate uh, finance, and that said responsibility establishes uh, that climate finance is not the same for the global south with regard to the global north. The committee uses General Observation 26 to recommend to make rec recommendations to states so that they take action at the legislative and public policy levels to meet their obligations with regard to the environmental pact. We, he also referred to the fact that the committee refers to international banking and their role in financing projects on the environment and how they should consider repairing the damage caused to the environment. Lastly, he also talked about the challenges of improving integration between the General Observation 26 and what is being addressed at the COP. It's very, it, it is uh, very much needed to have the children engage in these processes worldwide. In the second presentation, Shruti talked about climate change or climate finance and how mitigation has been historically uh, addressed in a certain way and how important it is to have a third pillar to address loss and damages. She also showed us that the trends show that there are significant gaps with regard to sources of finance that are mostly consist that mostly consist of credits and not grants. And there's also a branch because this financing is also geared towards mitigation and, and not reparations themselves. Shruti also mentioned that there are major challenges to states in, with regard to responsible finance for childhood. Finance should definitely consider loss and damages and integrate in project design the participation of children. She also recommended that it's important that states review their policies, their public policies, to include the voices of children and adolescents. In the end, we had a presentation by Goodbye and also a presentation by Longway, who talked about the importance of states, the importance of including children in their efforts together with the challenges in incorporating their voices into these processes and for that technical information is needed technical technical information information that is friendly to children to address their needs and to also strengthen the channels of communication and interinstitutional coordination to foster children's engagement to manifest their needs and priorities in budgeting processes. We also want to encourage everyone to renew your commitment as Save the Children and also as partner organizations to support these processes around budgeting so that they reflect the needs and priorities of children when assigning or allocating public resources. Thank you so much, everyone, for your engagement. Special thanks to our expert panelists for their presentations and for sharing their experiences. Special thanks also to the audience for your very interesting questions. And we have now come to the end of our webinar, but we would not like to let you go without first telling you that we will be sharing the recording and the presentations and the links with all of you, together with the questions that we've answered. 
and you will be receiving this material via email. Thank you everyone for your participation and I wish you a great rest of the day. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Ludmila. Thank you, interpreters. Juan. Yes, thank you, Laura. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thanks to the interpreters. Thank you all. Thank you so much.